Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to show you guys how I created a fully drivable car in Blender using their rigid body physics simulator. Uh, I thought it was really cool and it really took me a long time to figure out how to actually do it. So I decided just to share how it's done and the process that it took. And uh, that's what I'm going to be showing you guys today. I hope you enjoy it. All right, let's get started. Start out by finding a model you want to rig. I found this one on Sketchfab by Carol. The first thing I did is just clean everything up. I separated it into five parts, which is basically the car shell and the four tires. After separating your objects, set your origin point to the center of mass, uh, either surface or volume, whichever one works best. You just want the origin point to be directly in the middle of your object. The next thing you're going to want to do is to block out the five shapes. I just use a simple cube for the car shape and then a cylinder shape for the wheels. So for the cylinder shape, rotate it along the Y axis, the delta axis, and then align the wheel shape. And instead of just moving the object around, trying to find the right place, it's simpler just to go to snap, uh, selection to active, uh, but I have bad habits, so. Also, friendly reminder is to organize and name and or categorize your objects. I usually just separate my rigid body objects from my model objects, just so it's simpler to see. So there's a bug in Blender. For some reason, if you control Z a bunch of times, when you have rigid body constraints, it can crash. And so a way I found to avoid that is to go into your preferences under experimental and undo legacy. It's gonna make your undos a bit slower, but they are gonna be more stable. So once you have that enabled, we can go ahead and create our rigid body physics. So I'm just gonna click rigid body and the physics panel. So I'm just gonna make the cube an active rigid body and I'm gonna make the ground plane a passive rigid body as that way they can collide with each other. And I'm gonna do the same thing with the cylinder object. I'm gonna make them an active rigid body and under the collision, I'm going to enable a cylinder. And for each of the other tires, I'm just gonna go in the object, rigid bodies and copy from active. And that's just gonna save some time. So the reason why you should use your cylinder and rotate it on the delta axis, why? Is because when you use the co collision shape of a cylinder, you'll notice that the collision shape doesn't change at all in the edit mode, so you have to rotate it in the object mode. And so the reason why we don't just use the simple convex hull, it's not a perfect cylinder. You'll notice it's a bit bouncy and jumps around. <clears throat> and it's not as smooth as it is with a cylinder shape like what we have here. All right, let's add our constraints. So let's go ahead and select the car in the wheel. Good object, rigid body, down to connect. And you'll see our constraint pops up. So to make sure our constraint is perfectly aligned with our wheel, let's select our constraint and our wheel and go to snap, selection to active. And so I'm gonna use the connect and the selection to active a lot. So I'm gonna right clicking, add to quick favorites, and then by pressing Q, you'll have it as a shortcut. So I'm just gonna do that for each one of these objects. I'm going to connect the car to each wheel, and I'm gonna snap the constraint to the wheel object. So right now it's a fixed constraint. We're gonna to wanna to change the constraint type to a generic spring. So in the generic spring, you're gonna notice that there's a bunch of limiters. And so along the angular axis, it's just, just the rotation of the axis. So we wanna limit the rotation of the axis on both the Z and the Y axis. And then for the linear, it's just what's gonna move along the XYZ axis. So we don't want it to move at all along the X and the Y axis, and we only want it to move along the Z axis. I'm just gonna leave it at its default, and I'm gonna go ahead and enable the spring along the linear Z axis. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this the same exact generic spring for the other back tire and with the same exact values as the first one. You notice when I enabled springs along the Z axis, see that our suspension is already coming in. So this, the stiffness of the spring is it's just gonna be how stiff that spring is along the Z axis and the dampening is gonna be basically how bouncy that spring's gonna be. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and just parent our car shape to our car rigid body and our back tires to their back tire rigid bodies so that we can go ahead and see that our suspension's looking pretty good. So now that we have our back tire constraints, let's go ahead and create our motor constraints. And we do that by just simply a shift D duplicating our generics spring 
and then changing it to a motor constraint. The motor strength has the same angular and linear, and remember angular is just rotating around an axis. So we're gonna name the motor to rotate around an axis, and it doesn't tell you, but for some reason it only rotates around the x-axis, which is perfect for our case because that's the axis we want to rotate around. So we're gonna do the same exact thing for our other back tire, make it a motor constraint, and I'm just gonna play around with these settings a bit. We'll go ahead and fix those values later. I'm just gonna disable them for now. Let's go ahead and move on to our steering. Let's duplicate our wheel and I'm just gonna shrink it down and change our fixed constraint. And instead of connecting the wheel to the car, we're gonna connect our wheel to our steering object. And we're gonna change the fixed constraint to a generic. And again, we're only gonna want it to rotate it along the X axis. So we're going to limit all other rotations and movement to zeros. And then I'm going to go ahead and connect our steering object to our car and then snap our constraint to our steering object. And this is where we're going to put our suspension and also have it rotate along the Z axis. So let's make our constraint here a generic spring. And so we want it to rotate around the uh, Z axis. We want to limit uh, how far our tires turn. So I'm going to do 30 and negative 30. We're going to limit it to zero on the X and Y axis and then leave the Z axis default. And then we're going to enable our springs down here. And we're going to add a spring to the Z axis for the rotation. That way it will correct when the, the motor's not going. And then add a spring to the Z axis to add our suspension. All right, so now let's go ahead and make our motor constraint. And so we're just going to duplicate our steering constraint and make that a motor constraint. And again, a motor constraint can only rotate along the X axis. I'm going to rotate that. So you notice when we change the value of our target velocity from a negative value to a positive value, it'll turn left and right. And so I want the positive value to turn right and the negative value to turn left. So I'm going to go ahead and rotate the X axis so it's upright. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and make this wireframe so we can see it better. And I'm going to parent the wheel model to our rigid body object. I'm going to go ahead and test it out and you see that it's starting to work. All right, so I just want to do a little overview of what's happening. So this constraint is only constraining the wheel to our steering object. And it's only rotating around the X axis. And so we have our steering object is connected to our car and only goes up and down on the Z axis and then rotates on the Z axis. And then we have our springs on the rotation of this object and the movement along the Z axis. And so our motor constraint can only rotate around the X axis. If we want to rotate along the Z axis, we have to rotate this so that the X axis is pointing up and you can see the, our positive and negative values will rotate the steering object along this Z axis. Perfect, so that's why the orientation of your constraints is important because if we duplicate and then mirror along the X global, I'm gonna move this over. When we mirror, our constraints is inversed. So our motor constraint is backwards, basically. For it to work properly, we have to change these back to the default values. So just remember that the constraint orientation is important. All right, so I just discovered this. Uh, in this example, I showed you the orientation of the motor constraints so pointing down, but in the original tutorial, I have them pointing up and I could not figure out why that was happening. So this is a different rig than from the tutorial. And in this rig, I have the steering object as first and the second as the car. But in the tutorial, I have it as car and then steering. If I switch the order of our objects, the rotation, the motor constraint changes. So I found out that the order that your objects are connected to is very important. All right, so now let's add a rig control. I'm just gonna use a simple plane and delete the face just so we have a nice wireframe. So what we're gonna wanna do is parent all our rigid bodies and constraints to this rig control. So I'm going to go ahead and select all the rigid bodies and parent them to our rig control so we can pick it up and move it around easily. And so this is a found out. I just parented all the constraints to the rigid body car object, which works fine. But I ended up moving it at some point in the tutorial point in which your wheels rotate is shifted. And so you'll notice that it's a it's unstable now, which was really annoying to figure out. 
For the constraints, it doesn't really matter what they're parented to as long as they're in the correct position, but you might just be safer off just parenting everything to the rig control. It's not important where they are parented to, it's important where they are when you start your simulation. So once you have everything connected to your rig control, you can notice you can move it around, but only on the first frame that you can move it around, and that's because the rigid body's cache is not simulated yet. So if you can't move it around, it just means you have to reset to your first frame, which is just shift the left arrow for a quick shortcut. Let's go ahead and select our rig control and add a new custom property. I'm just gonna go and go ahead and create two here. The first one's gonna be the drive property. So this can control air back tire motor constraints. I'm gonna make the max value 10 and the minimum value negative 10 and set the default value to zero. For the second property, I'm gonna make this the steering property with a max value of one and a minimum value of negative one. Change the precision down to one, and that's just how many you know zeros are behind the decimal. And then you're gonna go ahead and find your, your new property drivers in the items panel under properties. So properties and drivers are really cool and really complicated, but the easiest way to create a driver is go ahead and right click on your value and copy as new driver. So we're going to take this value and driver and we're going to go paste it in our back motor constraints under target velocity. And I'm going to do that for the other tire. So what this allows you to do is control your motor constraints through your drive property. I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing for the steering. Right click, copy as a new driver, find our motor constraint and paste driver that we copied. And we're going to do that for both motor constraints. So now we have a steering property. This allows us to drive and steer our car. Next, you just have to fine tune for your specific car that you want. So go ahead and find your back wheel suspension constraint and just fine tune the value and just find a value along the limit constraint to limit how high or how low your suspension is going to be. Basically 1M, which is a meter, which is basically just one of these blocks on the floor. So it's going to depend on the scale of your object and the suspension of your car. Next a good one is to find your steering constraint and to find out where exactly along the wheel that you want it to turn and it's going to be different for whichever car you decide to rig. Another thing to fine tune is the friction of your objects. So the friction of your ground and your tires can be found under the rigid bodies tab under surface response, which is going to be the friction or bounciness of your ground and wheels. Another thing you can do is to go ahead and block out the simple shape of your vehicle so that you can go ahead and add collisions with different objects. The reason I didn't do this in the beginning is because the car and the wheels can interact with each other. So now that our suspension's a bit stiff and that's because the car rigid body and the wheels rigid bodies are hitting each other. So a simple way is just to change the collection layer that it's on. And the only reason I don't like to do this is because I forget which ones are on which. So since our tires are on the first layer and our car is on the second layer, an object will only collide with the first layer. So you have to make sure whatever object your vehicle is colliding with is on both layers. Another important thing to note is where the origin of your object is at because the weight is going to be distributed around that origin. So you notice if we move it to the back here, our weight is now shifted around that point, that origin. So we still get co collisions along our mesh, but the weight is shifted around the origin of your object. Typically, you can just change your object origin to geometry and it should be in the around the middle. <clears throat> the origin is important for your wheels and car. Another thing to note is your rigid body constraints iterations. And you'll notice that when the constraint is stressed, our tires flex a bit. So to change that, you can just go to override iterations and just crank this up to a value that's more stable. Another important thing could be speed in your rigid body world. I find 1.5 is just a good overall value for me. Uh, another important Thing to consider is the scale of your objects. You'll notice that if I scale all my objects up, our simulation is going to become a bit slower, and that's just it's calculating the weight and size of the objects. And the smaller it is, the quicker it is. But you'll notice that any kind of change is going to ruin your constraints, so it's best just to decide your overall scale in the beginning. Another thing to note is how 
which bodies are cached. Down on the timeline, you can notice this yellow bar loading in your cache, and so it's going to save your cache until something changes. So it's always going to play the same cache, the same simulation over and over, as long as you just reset it to the beginning of the timeline, unless you move or change a rigid body or a value. So that's important knowing because how the drivers are set up, if your rigid body objects aren't parented to the rig control and you change something in the rig control, it will just keep using the old cache over and over and you won't be able to change it. So it's important just to have those parented that way it knows that there's been a change. So you can use keyframes, but I just found out a better way to do it. It was to be, so if we want our car to go forward and then back and then drift off, we can go ahead and record those values. And then our cache will be baked from that point. So we can just go to current cache to bake and that'll bake our cache that we recorded. And that's better than just pressing bake because once you do that, all your values that you changed in the middle of the simulation are only recorded from the final values or your current values at the beginning of the timeline. Okay, so I hope that wasn't too confusing, but uh, you can definitely get even more advanced with these kind of rigs. You just using the rigid body physics and constraints you can make a much more complicated rigs like this monster truck. And you can also, of course, do some cool things like break it apart and destroy it. And uh, I think I'm going to make another video on actually how to connect your phone to Blender and actually drive the car around using an app called Jockey. It's just kind of fun. <laughs> Video will probably come out pretty soon, so stay tuned for that. And if you are interested and you don't want to have to do all this, I am working on an add-on that actually just basically sets it up itself, uh, trying to make it as simple as possible. And I've just been working on it just for fun to learn how to actually make add-ons. So if that's something you're interested in, I'll probably have it linked down below. Yeah, hopefully it's cool. Hopefully you learned something and I didn't just waste six months of my life. All right, that's it. Bye.